Okay. Hello, everybody. Um, I just want to welcome you all today to our um, uh, workshop with Andrea Jones, um, focusing on empathetic audience engagement. Um, thank you all so much for coming today. Um, Andrea, what you won't know necessarily is that we have a wealth of experience in, in the digital room here, some brilliant practitioners of empathetic audience engagement. Um, so this will be, you know, second nature to um, all of these people here today. Um, so this is a more focused cohort than the last group that we worked with. Um, and we form together an MPO um, cohorts or consortium together through CMP. Um, and it's all thanks to Arts Council England that we're able to do this today. And I'd also like to thank Andrea, um, who's joining us hey. from Washington, but I'll let Andrea introduce yourself. Oh, great. Thank you. How many people do we have this morning? 14, it looks like. Mm -hmm. um, yes, um, my name is Andrea Jones, and I am coming to you from a city that has been really burning for the last four nights in a row. So it's a little bit of a... Um, apocalyptic situation here in Washington, D.C. Luckily, my family and I live um, kind of up on the, in the suburbs, so we haven't had any of our, you know, our safety has not been threatened, but um, it, it definitely is a, a time to be mindful of, uh, of the outer world and, and for museums. You know, I've been looking to see how museums are responding in this moment, um, and, and if they can be responsive in a way that seems authentic and um, empathetic. Um, and, you know, various museums have stepped up and sort of made um, some statements in solidarity with those who are protesting. And I think that's, you know, really great. Um, so anyway, <laughs> this is the situation we're in. It's kind of like the apocalypse within the apocalypse. Um, so a little bit about me, I have been working in the museum field, um, well, in education for about 20 years. I started out as a um, high school social studies teacher, history teacher, um, and I transitioned into the museum field and have really just loved it. I think this is where I was meant to be the whole time as an educator um, because uh, you don't have to test kids on anything. You just have to interest them, um, spark that creativity and spark the inspiration. Um, I have really focused my work in experiential learning and not just for children, for adults as well, um, participatory experiences. And that's why the name of my business is uh, Peak Experience Lab. And Along with that, so I began to develop sort of um, role-playing games and other kinds of, you know, put yourself in someone else's shoes sort of experiences. And that got me really thinking heavily about empathy. Um, I was fortunate enough uh, a couple of years ago, ago to be invited with several other museum professionals to meet with the Dalai Lama in India um, and talk about compassion and empathy specifically in museums and the potential um, that museums have to um, you know to foster empathy in the world um, and secular ethics which is what the Dalai Lama was um, emphasizing anyway um, that experience if you'd like to read more about that on my blog peakexperiencelab.com um, really did change my view and made me emphasize this work, um, focus this work, um, and study uh, psychology um, and learn lots more about empathy and exper uh, experimenting with different ways that we can both be empathetic as institutions, but also foster empathy with our um, visitors. So that's where I'm coming from with this. And I think I'm going to share my screen now, Celine. It's time for screen sharing, everybody. Watch out. Um. Okay, I'll also say while Andrea's sorting that out, I think I've made you co-host there, Andrea, so you should be oh. able to, there we go. Um, Great. Just to say, if anyone's got any questions, feel free to pop them in the chat. Um, but yes. Andrea and I were just talking about the weird nature of speaking into the void on Zoom as well. And so we'd quite like, with it being a smaller cohort as well, to uh, have some conversation. Um, so maybe feel free to butt in if there's something you want to you know, ask in the moment. But um, we are going to try and 
like I said, record this first bit and then we'll have breakout rooms um, which won't be recorded and you can have a chat within that. And then after that, we're aiming to have a bit more of a discussion. So um, maybe we do um, Q and A's in the chat for the moment, if you have any, um, and then we'll do more of a chat later on. And also to say, um, because it's so warm today, we're gonna have a little comfort break as well. So don't worry, we'll make sure everyone stays hydrated. Okay, Andrea, sorry. Great, um, and Celine, I will I will um, rely on you to kind of um, let me know about what's happening in the chat because I'm terrible at looking at at that. Um, no so, and it's hard to see when you're doing a PowerPoint when you've got it on slideshow mode. Um, but I really would appreciate it if people commented because this is kind of how we do it these days, right? This is how we can all participate. Um, so, this is a. Uh, a workshop on empathetic audience engagement during the apocalypse, and I'll explain a little bit about why I'm using the word apocalypse instead of pandemic um, later. Um, but I'm having trouble. Okay. So there's three, this actually was based on a blog post that I wrote in March um, when all of this kind of started to go down. Um, you know, it just um, kind of occurred to me that museums were really going to be in a place of having to reinvent themselves and not by choice. Um, and I had recently finished a project that made me think a lot about identity um, with, you know, within ourselves, ident identity and, and personal transitions. Um, but that also relates to organizations that have to go through transitions. And so the first section of the blog post was, is about identity transition. The second is about um, audience segmentation, how we think about audiences um, really needing to change in terms of their, you know, looking at them for, through um, the lens of emotion. And then the third part is just about really ideas and reinvention. Um, how do we reinvent ourselves and what are museums doing right now um, to experiment? And so that's how I'm going to divide up the, the workshop today in those three um, sections. So the first thing is that we, right now, the whole world is going through this, right? Everybody feels together, and you see this phrase a lot, we're all in this together, we're all in this together, but we are all having very separate experiences during this time. And so that's the thing that, you know, where, you know, empathy is really a needed skill so that we can um, understand that our audience's experience is not necessarily our experience. Um, so I want to ask you right now how you're feeling. So <laughs> which, and we can use the poll feature, Celine, because we have that. I want to ask you out there, which photo best represents your work self right now? How are you feeling? And you can, <clears throat> okay, I see the poll. Great. Looks like we have, ooh, kind of an even, an even race coming here. Celine, are you thinking about which one is you, which one represents you? Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to work out the, the one that represents somebody who's trying to manage a poll on Zoom. <laughs> not intelligently at the same time. <laughs> right. Okay, shall I end that now? We can see it's a fairly even split, can't we? It really is. I mean, people, this actually underscores my point, right, that people are feeling very different ways. Um, it looks like, A, the woman with her hand over her face, um, is the most prevalent feeling. Does anyone want to um, chime in in the chat and tell tell us why you picked that one? What does that represent for you? Or any of the A, B, C, or D, or, or none of the above it could also be a response. Does anyone want to chime in? Well, I picked A, but um, I was kind of between A and B. I would have liked to, because sometimes I have moments of that, and then sometimes I have moments of that, and then I go back to that again. So that's where I am. <laughs> That's a great point that we all cycle through these different feelings at different points of the day. Um, also worth noting, I mean, I, I gave this presentation a month ago and I bet that people are feeling distinctly different this month than they did last month. 
you know, we're kind of at a different phase of all this. Yeah. Um, um, I put C because I think we're trying to be so quite childlike and try and look at our organization with new eyes um, and that's what I feel I feel it's quite an exciting opportunity um, and that we're taking everything in from everywhere else and that's mm. what I'm taking as a television screen <laughs> <laughs> that's right we're all looking at screens constantly aren't we but I like that um, that child sort of um, embodiment that you're talking about anybody else I put, I, a, I put a because the rate of the rate of change is so fast it's very overwhelming um and that's why i'm kind of oh because everything seems to one way and then the next week it's another way and the next week it's another way and so yeah. oh so true um yeah that's every day is different right um i feel like you know with this new um kind of like racial um you know laying bare everything that has been wrong in our society this weekend for me has felt like the beginning of the pandemic again you know like we don't know what we're doing we have like all the museums kind of started to get a little bit of footing a little bit and now it's like well what? i don't know i don't know what we're doing anymore so yeah i'm totally with you on that um I, you know, personally too, I don't know how many of you have kids at home, but this, the, the monkey, the ape picture really spoke to me with children because, you know, you're trying to manage the pandemic and what, how to get groceries, um, your work, and then also just having, you know, like your kids always there <laughs> on your back. Um, that's my situation. In fact, right now I hear, um, my toddler stomping, uh, do, I don't know, there's construction going on upstairs. So we all have those things going on. All right, I think we can close the poll. I just want to acknowledge that everybody's feeling different all the time. And not only do we have to take care of each other in the workplace and realize, give each other a little bit of slack for that, but also realize that our audiences are there too. And so what we have normally done in the past may not really resonate in the same way. Okay, so the project that I was talking about that really got me thinking about identity uh, and transitions, life transitions, was a project at a museum called the Mattituck Museum, which is in um, Connecticut in the, in the United States. Um, it's a, a post-industrial town. So the picture there that you see is uh, like pretty much how the whole town looks like. This is a town that was full of the brass brass industry. Um, and then really like starting in the 60s and in the 70s, 80s, it just completely died. And now they're just left as a sort of shell of themselves. And they were, their whole town's image was we're the brass city. You know, so what are they now if they're not the brass city? They are collectively experiencing an identity sort of crisis. Um, and so what we did with, um, I wrote an interpretive plan for that exhibit. So that's part of the work that I do is interpretive planning for exhibits, uh, exhibitions. Okay, yeah. yes. okay. sorry, to, sorry to interrupt. Can we zoom in on that slide? Because at the moment we can see like the whole slide deck. I was wondering if we can. Oh, really? Yeah, just. Um, you can only, so what, what can, you can't see the slideshow? I can see like the one on the left and then I don't know if everyone else can see the next slide as well and then this. Oh, you see this. Oh. Mm -hmm. A second. Okay. I just think that picture's really interesting. It'd be good. To I know how to fix it. Hold on. Oh. Sorry. I have Start two screens. This is what's happening is I had two screens and um, I picked the wrong one to share. Is that better? Wait, hold on. Is that better? Okay. That's brilliant. See, really good. Okay. Thank you. Sorry about that. <laughs> and everybody was getting a glimpse of the slide ahead, which is sometimes fun. But um, let's be professional about this. Okay. So um, let, this is the picture. Um, we, we chose to frame the entire um, history of this town around the question, how do life's big changes affect who we are? And um, so instead of making this about the town that used to be brass, um, and then having to kind of have this like glorification of a certain era, we just really turned the focus outward and made the exhibit about everyone. 
you know, this is about all of our life transitions and, and this is about how this town is going through this, but everybody goes through these transitions. Um, who are we now if we're not this? And really, if you think about this, this happens to everybody. I'm sure everyone, I was going to say in this room, we can call it a room, has been through some kind of life transition, whether it's getting a new job, whether it's ending a relationship and starting a new one, whether it's, um, you know, having a baby really changes who you are, your whole identity changes. Um, you know, if you're, if you're married to the same person for a long time and then all of a sudden you're not, you actually have to figure out who you are if you're not who you were with this person. Um, you know, for me, I went through a huge transition when I um, came out of the closet. Um, when I was actually a you know, full-grown adult <laughs> um, and, you know, had to figure out all kinds of questions about what kind. So if I'm not straight, so I just figured that out first. I'm not straight. And then... But I'm like, well, what what does that mean? You know, if I'm if I'm gay, am I, am I like a rainbow flag waving activist, or am I, you know, kind of like creeping along like incognito? Am I, um, you know, how do I how do I act differently? Right? It's a huge transition. Um, so anyway, all of these can be really metaphors for what museums are going through right now. Um, who are we now if we don't have visitors, right? Who are we now? So, um, well, this is the slide actually for that. So this book, this book that um, you're seeing, Transitions, Making Sense of Life's Big Changes, this is the book that we use to, to organize um, the exhibition. And I really highly recommend this book uh, for what we're going through right now. Um, so, in the book, William Bridges, who studied transitions, um, has the, has laid out these three stages that we all go through um, when we go through transitions. First is the endings, which I think is brilliant, you know, that we begin with the end. You know, oftentimes we think about things just beginning and our, and our culture doesn't really focus on that grief portion of it. We don't really spend time there because, whoa, that's not uplifting or uh, it's not a happy time. But, you know, sometimes that can be very liberating and good too. So endings is basically saying good goodbye to old habits and the old identity. Um, the neutral zone, which he calls it, which I can't really wrap my mind around the idea that it's neutral, but nevertheless, it's a liminal space. Um, this is really where the transition happens. This is where you are exploring different identities. So you know that you're not the old identity, but you don't know who you are anymore. So you're exploring. Um, and within that time, it's extremely, um, it's extremely hard emotionally because you are, you don't know what's, like some of you expressed just now, you don't know what's happening next. And that is a very unsettling feeling. Um, but at moments you might have excitement, right? Like this could be something great. Um, and, and some of it can be freeing, you know, like think about uh, if you've ended a relationship and you're like, um, you're sad about that. But there's also the moment where you're like, oh, so I don't have socks on the floor anymore. Like this, is, this could be good, you know. Um, so, I mean, in the same thing with museums, maybe there's things that you can let go of that you always wanted to let go of in the field and you don't have to let, you don't have to hold on to those things. And then lastly is beginnings. And, you know, I think a lot of museums right now are trying to start beginnings. I don't know how, I think, you know, Celine and I were talking about this, um, the idea of opening back up is, uh, is on a lot of people's minds here in the States maybe not so much in the UK, I'm not sure. Um, but I think people are starting to think that way. So they're trying to forge, they're trying to start <laughs> start that new relationship maybe without saying goodbye to the old one in some cases. Um, so, uh, you know, this is, I think being really cognizant of these stages can help us go through healthy transitions and that's what we really want. The new normal, um, we keep hearing that, right? 
right now is not the new normal. This is a liminal space. This is a, you know, we don't know what's happening. We really won't be, you know, really t fully to a new normal until the pandemic is officially over. And who knows when that will be. Um, but we will have tr transitioned and experimented and changed and made choices. And then we will somehow come out of this, you know, a different, um, a different culture. But we don't know what the new normal is yet. I want to, um, sh I don't know if you all uh, are familiar with the research of Susie Wilkening. She's a, a really, she's a friend of mine, but she's also a really great audience researcher um, in the museum field. She focuses only on the museum field and um, she does these uh, huge audience surveys where she looks at how people are feeling in the moment. And she's just done one um, relating to the pandemic and so I thought it was really interesting and, and underscores some of what I've been talking about. Um, so this whole idea of like getting back to normal or doing the things that we used to do is not what people need. And um, she says, regardless of length, museum goers expect high quality, meaningful experiences that are authentic to this moment, right? That means considering where your audience is right now and not simply repackaging old content. You know, and so I think that repackaging of old content was totally fine in the first few weeks of the pandemic. I mean, everybody was like, well, let's just show them that we're still here. We still exist, right? And so putting out those digital lesson plans that you created last year or um, pushing out, um, you know, videos that you'd made uh, previous to the pandemic or, um, old author talks or whatever you're doing. But now, you know, we're, it's not new anymore, right? I think that audiences are really getting a little bit more, you know, we're all having these, um, you know, different amounts of fatigue with, with the stuff online. So we really have to, especially now, be cognizant of where people are right now. Um, here's another quote from one of her... Um, one of her audience surveys, a cultural institution must somehow become indispensable to survive the coronavirus crisis. Doing nothing whatsoever invites cultural disaster. I mean, so I think in the States, we are especially at risk because we don't have a lot of government funding for our cultural institutions. Um, you know, but I think regardless, there is a, a, um, culling away of, of a lot of unnecessary institutions right now. We're looking at um, who, who's going to get the funding, who's going to, which audiences are going to stay with you in this. Well, no one, if you don't actually prove that you can be responsive and can be um, necessary, and I love the word essential, um, are we essential or are we just something nice to have? You know, and if so, how do we make ourselves essential. And I think that has everything to do with how we are responding in this moment to people's real emotion uh, and real circumstances and not imagining that we are always going to be interested in the same content that we were before. And here's another viewpoint. I might not feel comfortable until the vaccine is available coming back to the museum she's talking about. There are people that are freaked out by this. You know, I mean, everybody probably in this room has different amounts of risk aversion. Um, and, you know, so the idea of opening back up and just kind of making it more sanitary is not actually going to solve the problem for a lot of people. Um, we don't know what, how, you know, what the percentage of, of that will be, um, but there's some real fear out there that we have to be mindful of. So we don't know how society will change, right? But we know that it will. And I think everybody probably understands that by now, that there is no return to normal. Although I do, I still am having conversations with people all the time where they're like, well, if we could just make it to spring, everything's going to be back to normal. Let's just kind of like hold it, you know, kind of hole up in the corner until then. If we can just make it, if we can, maybe we have some funding that we can, you know, eke by and just kind of like keep, 
you know, pedaling gently until then instead of really engaging. But man, you don't know what, you know, you're not going to be ready for this new normal, whatever it is, if you cannot actually start that transition, if you can't get in there and experiment and be present with people now. You know, it's going to seem like a foreign universe, right? So look at all the trends that are happening. I look at trends and not just in the museum field. I look at trends in every sector of society because we're not isolated. All of us are interwoven. I'm looking at what's happening, <clears throat> excuse me, in education, how online education is uh, really driving some inequities um, for kids. You know, they're, they're, there's like the digital divide and they're not getting instruction the way they used to. How does that affect us? Um, how does physical isolation in general affect us? How does the mass failure of small business affect us? Um, you know, and how, how can we look, you know, look at those trends as well? How does civil unrest affect us? So um, all of those things are going to make us different. And that's why I always um, keep an eye on them. Um, the other thing that can be useful during <laughs> during this crisis to know is that we're all puppies with hats now. Um, we all may have to play different roles than we're used to playing. Um, you know, here in the States where there's been lots and lots of layoffs, you know, people are operating on with skeleton crews. And so people who didn't used to do social media may be forced into that role. Or, um, you know, and actually sometimes what we're looking at is uh, skills that didn't used to actually, we didn't need these skills as much or we didn't think we needed these skills suddenly become immensely important and we didn't even know people on our staff could do um, X, Y, and Z. Um, <clears throat> you know, like if, um, if you have gardening skills and suddenly like the outside of your building is the most important thing. Um, you know, maybe somebody in marketing actually knows how to um, make the building look nicer and you rely on people in different, you know, different roles to do these things. Um, <clears throat> I know directors that have done a complete audit of people's skills. You know, let's like just write down what everyone can do. If you can play the guitar, I want to know about it. <laughs> you know, if you can build model trains, like whatever you do, I just, you know, I want to know what everyone's skills are so that we can know what we're really working with um, and, and know what, you know, how that can fit in. You never know. So endings are, you know, as I mentioned, really important, but how do you do them? How do you actually grieve the old patterns of your life? Well, um, I, there's a couple, and I, I really do think that we have to be purposeful about grieving. You know, it's not just something that you think about at night as you're going to sleep, like, oh, I miss everything. Um, you, I mean, some of us have had tears, and that's great, but um, there's a lot of research to show that rituals are really important when it comes to grieving. This is why we have funerals in our society, right? You don't have to have a funeral, although you could for certain um, aspects of work. Um, I actually know about a circumstance where a company had reduced their, um, uh, there was a, a whole department that had been eliminated from the company. And so they decided to have a, a funeral for that, um, for that department. Because think about it, things like this happen oftentimes in organizations with an expectation that there is no emotion attached to it. Just like, oh, this department is gone. Uh, we're not going to, you know, let's just, you know, have a stiff upper lip and, and not talk about it. These people are gone. We know you used to talk to them. Get over it, right? Um, but it's so, so important to do this grieving. Um, this book called Rituals for Work is another one that I recommend. Um, it's not written especially for the pandemic, but um, the guy that wrote it, uh, Kursat Ozink, I went to India with on that um on the Dalai Lama trip. And I just love his approach. He actually uses design thinking and rituals, the idea of rituals, which are um, apparent in every single culture that, you know, every single culture has rituals. But how can you actually design a ritual 
for certain things that you need in the workplace to address emotions. And so um, here's an example where Zipcar um, went to an all mobile interface. So when you order a Zipcar, do you have Zipcar in the UK? You, no? Okay, these are just like these rent cars that you can uh, share with people. You know, you sign up um, to have a car for an hour or two hours or something like that and you take so Zipcar the company was um, Instead of booking your car online through your desktop computer They made it so that you could only do that through mobile a, a mobile app and to help everybody think mobile to you know really shift their whole brain to thinking mobile the employees um, they had this huge like party where they had a whole bunch of desktop computers and they just literally had people smash them with hammers um, to, to like physically show we are moving from this stage to this stage and so have fun with it but also like grieve that you know we're no longer talking about desktop I mean of course that's a little bit less of a um, emotional circumstance than than we're having but I think nevertheless physical um, a physical grieving, a ritual, can really help people. Um, here's another physical example. Um, a children's museum in Pittsburgh has a thing where, uh, interactive actually, where you can, like kids can draw pictures of things that are negative in their life, and then they can shred them in this giant shredder. And then the paper is colored, and so the paper actually in, becomes something uh, like a different form and they put the colorful paper into a jar and kind of like make it into an art piece so it's like trans like your negative thought feeling or memory is really kind of like physically transformed in front of your eyes and i think that's a really interesting idea um the picture that i took here i'm actually burning you know pre-corona museums and it wasn't just, you know, to be funny. I, I mean, I'm really thinking about things like burning things being useful. Um, you need to see it. Sometimes our feelings need to be like seen in the physical world. Um, likewise, your website is one of those things that people see. It's not exactly physical, but it's some. It's a physical, sort of like a physical presence. Um, and it, it probably is what most people see of you right now, um, besides the outside of the building. This, um, and I think we're, we're, it's getting better, but at, <laughs> towards the beginning of the pandemic, the first couple of months, um, I was seeing so many museums that just had these sort of zombie presences online. It was like, here's our old website, but nothing, everything's canceled. You know, <laughs> like just looked like everything is totally canceled. Um, we would have had this workshop, but we don't anymore. We would have had the, and you know, because everybody was thinking, well, we might, we might open up in a couple of weeks. We might, things might, it's like, no, no, actually everything needs to be, you know, I think it's a really good thing for your audiences and it's a good thing for your, um, for just your employees too, to have to go through the website and look at it through the eyes of someone who, um, you know, needs a new beginning in, in some ways. They need to see that you are not holding on to the past, that you're not holding on to all those old programs that were canceled um, because, it you know, people know, right? <laughs> people know stuff is canceled. Um, to focus on what you are doing um, can help people to kind of continue to not hold on to those things. Um, this idea of opening... So I, th I see a lot of museums now in the States that are, th they're allowed to open, right? So legally, they are allowed to open. So does that mean that they open? Well, I mean, a lot of them are still not dealing with the endings. <laughs> they are opening without having gone through any kind of transition at all. So they're basically ha saying, we're going to sanitize everything. We're going to have forced march um, wayfinding. We're going to have hand sanitizer. We're going to have require face masks. Um, our, but our experience is exactly the same. It's just a lesser experience now. It's a, 
It's a, you know, please do not touch anything. Please move in a direct line. View this statue and then keep moving, you know, because someone is six feet behind you who wants to see it. Um, I just, you know, I, I'm not saying that we shouldn't open. I, I don't know. I, I actually am like leaning away from that it, for certain organizations that have not really done the work of outwardly thinking about who they could be to their audiences if they're not in the building. If they're not in the building, what are you? And I think that work is what we really need to be thinking about right now. Um, <clears throat> not just getting people back to where we had them to begin with. Um, and then, as you pointed out earlier, um, Celine, I think it's a real ethical issue too. I mean, if you're saying that you're going to have, we know that the disease is spread when people are in a, in a confined space for um, long lengths of time, right? And so if we're saying come into our buildings, we're basically saying have a higher chance of getting this disease. And maybe that's worth it for some people and maybe it isn't. And, you know, you can say, well, visitors will decide. But you can also decide whether you think that's a good idea, right? And we're also learning that, <laughs> that visitors are not following the rules. I mean, I don't know <laughs> if this is an American thing. Americans are just terrible at following rules. But people are just not doing what – they're not being socially distant. They're not wearing masks. You know, so whatever plan you have for reopening, it better include the fact that people are not following the rules. So what do you need to let go of? This is a question I want you to answer in the chat box. So have you thought about all the things that maybe your organization or you personally need to let go of? And I have a picture here of Marie Kondo. You probably, if you've seen that Netflix series, she always says goodbye to the clothes. <laughs> she, when she says, get rid of the clothes in the closet, she's like, college t-shirt that I wore during the kegger. Uh, thank you for your service. You were a good t-shirt. And then goodbye, right? And I thought that was really hokey until I actually tried it. I went through my entire closet and I actually said goodbye to some of the old clothes that I had um, and it really did help. But what is something that you need to say goodbye to right now? And just type that in the, in the chat box. I'm seeing if I can... I don't know if I can actually see the chat right now. Does it come up on your um on your bar there? Ah, uh, here we go. System. Yeah. Old dynamics. Yeah, the um the digital meeting <clears throat> doesn't always do the same thing, does it, in terms of dynamics with the team at all? This can also be something that you give to yourself as homework, you know, that you kind of say goodbye to and, and you maybe invent your own ritual for doing that, whether it's shredding up a piece of paper with the things that you need to get rid of or burning it or, um, you know, having a meeting with staff and saying, what should we say goodbye to? What should we, you know, collectively say goodbye to? Um, events yeah fundraisers old ways of working yeah i'm trying to think of the things that i mean we you know i'm constantly going through this too you know i talk about these issues a lot but that doesn't mean i'm not going through them also i mean there's something every day that I think about, I think I'm doing this the old way. I mean, I am, um, even the job that I have, you know, doing education work means trying to think about, um, you know, as a person who really, really um, believes in participatory experiences, what does that look like now? How can we use things that are not, you know, not touchable? So because Sarah Scott from Falmouth has said that getting messy and creating artwork with children in close contact. Oh, yeah. Right. You know, and it, it's not that we can't do this ever again, right? 
that's the tricky thing with this grieving part because we are going to have that again at some point, but we can't wait that long to be relevant. That's, that's really the point. We have to kind of do these, this work so that we can be relevant now and not just wait to, to, to that point. Fundamental museums and galleries interacting with real objects, yeah. So that's something to keep in mind for you and your and your staff as you move forward into and really try to acknowledge and honor the fact that you need to grieve. Big exciting plans. Yeah, you know, there are things that like I know people who are working on giant exhibitions that were about to open right when the pandemic hit. I can't, you know, that's just crushing. That's really, really hard. All right, we're going to go on with our um, therapeutic session here. So the neutral zone is something that we can be in purposefully. And I want to emphasize that. It feels really icky right now. It feels uncertain. Uh, it feels uh, like we're having emotions that are at different times. But if you really try to be purposeful about how you are you know, that means like acknowledging that it's okay to feel those feelings. It also means that you're free to experiment and that you don't have to have the answers because you shouldn't have the answers. Um, it means that you should listen to what people are going through and not be as, you know, as a museum who is audience focused um, to really think about let's slow things slow things down and really try to listen to people um, to build to build in the time that's necessary to actually re respond in the now to be in the now is so important and actually this is very true when it comes to any life transition what you're doing today could be different than what you're doing tomorrow and so to keep the the worry from just overtaking your brain you have to just focus on what's happening now. That is, that's a terrible thing. I mean, museums that are, um, you know, in, in the former world, I would say, plan in advance, stop being so impulsive museums, right? I mean, I, I would have, like when I was running a, an education department, my um, staff would come to me with these ideas for programs like, you know, like let's have an escape room. Um, like in two weeks, you know, or something. I'm like, okay, slow down. Um, let's think about this. Let's be strategic, you know. And you know, now I'm a little bit. I'm like, I'm, I'm still like, let's, let's know why we're doing it. That's definitely still the case. Let's know why we're doing it. But let's like experiment a little bit more than we would have in the past. Um, resist long-term planning as much as possible because you really don't know what you're planning for, right? You could design this whole big thing that's set to launch in 2021 and it's no rel longer relevant. So um, it's, a, it's a terrible situation, but that's, <laughs> that's what the situation we're in. We have to accept. Um, generally, the idea here is just to listen and face outward. I, I've, I chose this picture because it felt so metaphorical to how we are. We're, we kind of feel like we're out on this cliff, you know, like, okay, inside our house feels safe, but out there is just danger, you know, and, um, but, but at the same time, it's so important to look out there right now, and, and so important to listen to what people are going through, to talk to them, to reach out, um, to continually monitor what's going on in the news, to continually monitor what's going on in society, and, and then, you know, if you need to, like, come in off the cliff and take some time for yourself because it's too overwhelming, then do that, do that, right? But we cannot just buckle down and wait it out. We have to really face outward. And I'll explain a little bit more about that, um, the mechanics of that too. So let's see. Okay, sorry about that. Um, so what I'm talking about here is practicing cognitive empathy and um, I think I mentioned before I've done some some delving into you know what is empathy on a deeper level, and one thing I've discovered is that cognitive empathy is really what museums should be practicing the most. And what that means, so there's emotional empathy, and that's really feeling 
with our audiences and feeling with our audiences and really kind of like stepping and putting ourselves in the sh in their shoes can be utterly exhausting. You know, it's like um, if you feel too much with people, then your own health is at risk. The other thing that happens with emotional empathy is um, you can actually develop some really terrible biases that help that, you know, so if you become very empathetic with one particular group, for example, then it, it keeps you from really being able to see what other people are going through that um, may, may be, um, have differing opinions, right? So cognitive empathy is using critical thinking to do this work. You're kind of just doing some brainstorming about, you know, how would you see the circumstance from different points of view? You know, so this um, cat is looking at this fish from a particular point of view, um, <clears throat> maybe as dinner, for example. Um, and then you might ask yourself, well, how would a baby view this fish? That would be really different, wouldn't it? And you can see the look on the baby's face, like in awe and wonder. The same fish, right? So if that fish were um, our current circumstances, our pandemic or uh, racial unrest, how are different audiences thinking about that? Just use that as a critical thinking sort of puzzle for your brain. And um, that can also help keep, keep it kind of in that cognitive realm that will be a little less exhausting for you, but very, very necessary. So instead of asking, how can we get them to come to the museum, right? We don't have a building. We should be thinking, how can we bring the museum to them? How? And I mean, I'm going to get into like the fact that we're over digitizing in a moment, but that's been our go-to, right? Um, how can we teach them what we're interested in? We have a boat museum. We have to teach them about boats right now. Well, let's be a little bit more abstract about that. How can we connect our mission to people's needs during this crisis? right? Like, do people need to know about boats right now? <laughs> well, I mean, let's, if we, if we need to teach them about boats, um, wooden, I know that there's a museum I know that like only teaches about wooden personal vessels, you know, like boat, <laughs> like one particular kind of boat. But if we think about the mission in a little bit broader sense and connect it to people's needs during the crisis, we can be a little bit more creative. You know, are you doing this to um, help alleviate boredom? Well, that's one way of thinking about it, but is that the most pervasive thing that's going on out there? Is that where you could be the most um, necessary or essential? Um, maybe it's a lot different than what you've been used to teaching. And I have some examples to show you later. Um, instead of asking, how can we reach their brains, which is what we normally think of? How can we reach their hearts? How can we help them to connect to each other? How can they, we help to connect to something meaningful? Because people are, um, of course, they still need to use their brains. And I think we can probably learn to look at those things together. Um, but it's not just about, like, let's learn the parts of the dinosaur, right? It's like, why, why do you need this in your life right now? Why do you need this now? Um, and and let's think, and I'll show you some examples, as I said. All right. Um, how are we doing on time, Celine? Okay. I just wanted to know, if, do we need a break now or should we? I think we're okay for a minute. It's 10 to, 10 to okay. ish, so fine. Okay, so for this next little part, I wanted to challenge you to sort of um, think outside the box with me a little bit. So, you know, familiar with Venn diagrams, how you have two circles that kind of um, overlap. So designing for COVID audiences is, is like this. In one circle, you have what you have and what they have. Okay, what you have could be um, 
your mission, your staff talent, you know, that secret guitar player could be one of them, um, your physical assets. So you have a building, you have a parking lot, you have um, a side, uh, you know, a, a side of a building, you have um, projection equipment. I don't know. You have, maybe you have steady funding and that's an asset. Maybe you have um, your credibility and your reputation. Maybe you have um, time, you know, that other people don't have. That varies from institution to institution. Um, you, ha you might have flexibility. What do they have? Now, this is something that we usually didn't ever think about. We never thought about what do they have. We just thought, well, let's get them in the building. And we've got everything. We've got the pipe cleaners to do the crafts, you know, and we've got all the stuff here. But they're in their houses, right? So what do they have that we could use? They have a house. They have all the items in their house. They have cars. They have a phone. Um, what are some other things that they have? What do you think? What are some other things that they have? Tell me in the chat box. Things that could be used for design purposes. Each other. Oh yeah, they have imagination. They have, oh, they have pets, true. A lot, some of them have immense amount of time. Some of them have zero time. Yeah, they have, um, you know, someone pointed out to me before, there's a lot of people without jobs right now and they have talents. They have so many talents to give that could be activated, right? A willingness to do something. Um, they have sidewalks in front of their houses. They have, um, we were talking about this last time, they have, there are empty storefronts, you know, um, stores that have been closed for a long time that are just sitting there like ghost, ghost towns. Um, and I, there was a project that I um, was made aware of where a museum was using these storefronts to do temporary pop-up exhibits, you know, where people could, um, you know, Inter not interact, but they, they could, the spaces had been activated, so it didn't look so dead. And I thought that was a really cool um, creative use of um, what they yeah. have. I think um, Museum of Cornish Life, so we have a couple of people here, um, Annette and Isabel from Museum of Cornish Life, and I think I'm right in saying for Flora Day, which is like an annual celebration of um, real importance in Helston, um, did you guys put photographs in the window? Because I was thinking about the assets thing and those windows have been really, really key. Um, and I'm, I'm sure people who were out on their walk were really desperate to see those pictures and to look for themselves and look for relatives and friends as well. Yeah, those are, those are awesome. Um, you know, there's a lot of different ways to activate spaces that we're really not used to thinking about because we're just used to thinking about getting people into our building. Um, I'm actually on the, the board of an organization called Omni Museum Project. I should have put a slide up here for that because the Omni Museum Project is a group of people who basically try to figure out different ways to hack the environments, the public spaces. Um, for museum-like learning. And one of the interesting things that, that we talked about on our last call was that, you know, we have these collections in our museums, but these collections are actually artificially taken out of their context and put in our museums. When really the objects in their own context, you know, aka in people's houses or wherever they used to live, are a lot more meaningful in some ways than when we you know, take them out, extract them, and put our own little labels on them. Um, <clears throat> you know, it's like we, we, we spend immense amount of money making these immersive environments for these objects, like this would have been this way, you know, um, when actually there's immersive environments everywhere. It's called real life, you know, and so if we just kind of use a museum lens to look at these things, um, it might be really interesting for people to, um, to view their own habitats in a different way. All right, I'm gonna continue on here. 
So um, the other thing in the circle was not what just what do you have, what do they have, but what do they need? Okay, so what they need, you have to really listen to, and we're not going to presume that we know, but one thing that museums are very um, often doing is designing for people's demographics, or they're looking at people in terms of their demographics. It might be gender, age, race, income, you know, um, whatever those things are, and um, marketing to them, you know, using these demographics. What if we took their, looked at their emotional needs, or even their physical needs during uh, the COVID-19 crisis, and designed for those instead? Because, you know, there are people of all different races that are sitting there um, with, you know, these very similar emotional needs, um, but they are very different. It's just not necessarily um, demographically dependent. Um, empathy is more than just acknowledging the current circumstances, right? Like we know that it, we're going through this. Let's reach out and like look deeper. Let's look deeper at what they're going through. So we have um, these, yeah, people are probably familiar with Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Um, I think it's especially appropriate now because there are a lot of people out there that don't have food, for example, right? That is a real need that people have. Um, safety needs include health. Look at that. There's a lot of people who are sick right now, right? Those are some real um, important needs and that museums are actually leaning into to help with right now. So for example, the Baltimore Museum of Industry is um, it has they, one of their things that they had, okay, so one asset that they had was a giant parking lot. So they looked at, if people can't come into our museum, what could we do with our parking lot? So they created a coronavirus testing site in their parking lot because in the States, it's hard, it's been very hard to get tests. There's not a lot of um, access to tests. And so they partnered with a hospital to put a, um, a testing site in their parking lot. You know, is that, does that have to do with industry, right? <laughs> well, you know, in times of crisis, maybe this is more important than teaching them how people used to can vegetables, right? This is what people need right now. Um, and there's a giant crane. That's, you're looking at the picture of the giant crane in the parking lot, which is not the testing site. <laughs> but um, you can imagine. Um, Serhole Mill in Birmingham um, turned their gift shop into a dry goods shop. I thought that was a really interesting way to respond. So, I mean, this is a natural fit too, right? They were a mill. Um, they used to, they made, historically have been making wheat and things like that for centuries. And now because they figured out that people in their community are having trouble getting hold of pasta and flour and things like that, um, what if they just turned their gift shop into a real um, dry goods shop? So physiological needs right there. But there's all these emotional needs too. We have people are lonely, right? They're in need of social connection. I mean, that's probably one of the biggest ones right now. How can museums design for that? How can our main purpose in every program that we think of be to connect people to each other? Um, people feel out of control and they wanna contribute. There are so many people out there with energy to be activists right now. Um, they want to do something, they want a sense of purpose. How could you design for that? Um, there's stress relief, joy, and novelty, right? There's just, you know, the need for joy in our lives. Um, there's also angst and really a need for processing emotions. That part museums, I, I don't think, have really done a lot of to this point. I do have a few examples, but I really wish we would look at doing a lot more of that. Um, some people have a lot of fear. You know, there are people out there who are living in abusive or unhealthy houses right now. Um, suicide rates have gone up, uh, especially in younger populations, um, teen populations, um, you know, people who are living in situations that are unhealthy. 
there's um, people who just need making help making sense of the new reality. Like, help me, give me some historical perspective. Give me a way to talk about the pandemic. Just let me talk, you know, talk it out through art, maybe some other circumstance. Um, and then there are people who are really angry. Um, here, you know, we have movements of people who are angry about um, that they don't have freedom to take off their mask, you know, to go to the store, right? And um, instead of saying to these people, like, well, you shouldn't feel that way, um, you know, it would be more interesting t to have a conversation about it. Um, and I think, you know, museums are, you know, have been in judgment, I think, instead of empathy in these situations um, a lot of the time. And then the necessary thing to think, too, is that these needs are always changing. So, you know, continue to stay in the design process. All right, so we're going to do this activity and then we're going to do break. Is that cool, everybody? Okay, so we're going to do some practice of listening. And, you know, I think it's, it's sometimes very daunting when you think about designing either a program or a pop-up or a take-home kit or whatever you're thinking about. Um, without actually listening to people, you're, you're thinking about it in terms of lots of people, right? But it might be easier just to consider one person and think about their needs as a jumping off point for some inspiration. So I've got a couple of these. I'm going to actually escape out of here and I'm going to share a different screen and okay got my computer sound on so you you may want to turn up the sound on your on the whatever device you're listening to I'm gonna play you um, these are, uh, these are audio clips from different people who work in grocery stores. And I think I'm going to play for you Courtney Meadows. So just to tell you what I'm going to do with these audio clips, I'm going to have you listen to two different people's circumstances, two different audio clips. And then we're going to put you in breakout rooms. And you're going to talk about this question, what do you wish for these people? What do you wish for these people? And you can pick one or both of them. You can focus on one of the two people, whichever one kind of sparks more conversation. Um, so that's what we're going to be listening for. Okay, so here's Courtney. And if you cannot hear the sound, just raise your hand and I'll try to fix it. It makes me feel more important now than what I've ever been. I mean, people are truly seeing who we are. And they're not seeing us so much at our job. You know, they're not seeing us as workers. They're actually seeing us as human beings. And that makes the world a difference in your life. You know that that's why you're being recognized. Okay, so that was Courtney. I'll let you kind of marinate on that, what you would wish for Courtney or what you think about what she just said. Um, and then meanwhile, I'm going to, I'm just going to drag this over and I have an audio clip from Chris. So these are both real people and real circumstances, and I think you'll see too, they're experiencing very different things. So I'm very close to my sister-in-law, my brother, and my niece who has uh, special needs and requires uh, four people to help her get through the day, including my family. And three weeks ago, the, my sister came down with the what turned out to be the virus, although it took two weeks to get tested. Um, and as a result, all the people who were helping, they couldn't ethically have them come to the house and help any longer. So it was just my brother alone 
taking care of his wife who was quarantined in one room and his daughter who no normally takes a whole bevy of people to help. And um, she, my sister-in-law is now getting better, but I just basically was doing everything I can to get them through it. And, um, and I felt, uh, usually I'm an anxious person, but um, because they were so stressed out, I couldn't afford to be anxious. And then, uh, and then I, when I would drive home after dropping off supplies or doing whatever it is I needed to do, I think the moment I fe felt terror and panic was when I would listen to the presidential briefings, which just made it feel as though we were all on our own, every single citizen, and that there was no adult running the show. And I really, that's when I would break down, honestly. So I had to stop listening. Um, but also all the gratitude for all the anonymous people who came out and helped them, who delivered food, they didn't, anonymously people would show up with water, with sanitary stuff, with stuff they didn't even need and it just piled up on the front and that was um, the part that I'm trying to focus on as they recover. Okay, so Chris and Courtney I should mention too, just uh, as a um, epilogue to Chris, he one of his skills as a person is to is activism actually, and he um, had a newspaper article. He got attention for their case and got a, a news article published, and that's why they received all of the different gifts from people. Um, but in that story too, if you want to focus on different aspects of the story, that's fine too, because there's the person with COVID, um, there's the the wife, right? And then there's also the caretaker, the husband, and there's Chris, and there's the little girl. So there's a lot of different people in that story that you could focus on uh, and get inspiration for and think about what you would wish for those people. All right, so Celine, I'm going to turn it over to you for the breakout rooms. Wish me luck. Okay. okay. <laughs> Does anybody have any questions before we, about what you're going to do? Okay. Um, okay, so in terms of time, should we give it five minutes? Um, sure. A little Sounds chat, good. it's nothing too in depth, and then we'll come back, and then um, after I've called you back, then we'll do a five minute break. Does that make sense, everybody? Um, so we can get all the information out quickly and then have a little moment to breathe. Okay, Andrea, it might try and put you in a breakout room because we're going to okay. do it automatically. You can come back out or you can stay. It's up to you. Okay. Right. So let me see. We'll do. Okay. Okay. Should be all right. Okay. So you should have your invites now. We'll see you in five minutes. And then Bryony, who's a creative director, who's just started. Funny you were talking about endings, just started in her new job. So. Oh, here's everybody. Welcome back, everybody. Um, do people want to take a quick break now? Because I'm aware of how hot it is. Well, the can I ask for just a, before people lose their train of thought, um, for them just to report out a few of their comments before we take a break? And un you can unmute yourself if you'd like, unless you have a really loud... Um, room that you're in. Um, but I would love to hear, I, I heard a couple of comments from people in different rooms, but I would love to hear um, any more. So can we start with Courtney? Um, your thoughts about what you wish for Courtney? I'll go. Um, we would, I was just talking about that this is, there is, there is a sort of maybe a kind of hope that things will be better after this and that there will be positive change and that people perhaps who haven't been valued before will be valued um, more in the future. Uh, now that we know that actually our entire world um, rests on people who work in supermarkets and people who clean and people who, you know, all these sorts of things that perhaps where people weren't, um, weren't appreciated before, that perhaps they will be and that people, uh, people's pay will be fairer, people's contracts will be fairer. That's kind of a hope I have that maybe something positive might come out of it. So that was what I would, wish for Courtney that she keeps to have that um keeps having that feeling of recognition and appreciation for what she does in her in her work that's great I heard that echoed in another room too and I I think that's a great you know in museums when they're you know one of the ways that museums can be 
you know, activist is to draw awareness to things and, um, you know, telling these stories. I think that's a, so it would be a really excellent thing to design for um, in the moment, you know, maybe in the past we focused on, you know, if you're a history museum, you may have worked focused on workers in the past or essential workers in the past, you know, maybe now is the great time to focus on workers now and what they're doing and how you can make those things visible and appreciative. Um, uh, uh, I don't know. What are other ways that you could, that we could appreciate Courtney and what she does? Um, I think it's sort of raising, um, you know, in our, if we are going forward talking about social history and raising the profile of those people throughout, you know, what people have done and, and frontline workers throughout time and kind of boosting them to a point um, where people appreciate the service that they provide and what they've done throughout all of these difficult times that we've faced and that continues today. And I think telling those stories in that way of reframing our histories could be powerful for people um, considering them in a different perspective. And I think Amy, that's why, you know, speaking from, so I, I work at the Museum of Cornish Life and it's one of the things we've always spoken about that we don't hold collections of the great and good, but we hold collections of as things people have in their kitchen you know, pat lunch baskets that everybody took to their work. And I think that's why people love our museum. And I think it's interesting just to raise that status again and be quite confident in that. Sounds like you've got a great niche to begin with. Yeah, I mean, if you took, you know, some of the emotional needs of these particular people and then married them with some of the other needs that we have, like, um, social connection, for example, you know, I'm like brainstorming ways, like how could we, you know, connect people who want to appreciate uh, essential workers with the essential workers? You know, how do we facilitate that process? You know, is it a billboard? Is it a pen pal? Um, is it a, right? Like what, how can we be the connectors for, for this? Anyone have um, thoughts about Chris and um, any of the people in his story? It was quite complex because there was a lot of different needs in that story because there were so many different people. Um, and it was interesting that I thought um, it's it, he he has his own needs, obviously he's talking about his family and, and the struggle that they're having, but he's got his own issues as well with, with his anxiety and things like that, which he almost feels like he can't feel because other people are struggling as well. Right. So for him, you might wish an outlet for his own anxiety or his own feelings. Yeah. I think, you know, a lot of us who are put in positions as caretakers, even if it's a you know, being a parent of a child, you know, you feel like you can't, you don't have time to express your own emotions in the moment. Um, I, I was really struck by one part that he said where he said, I felt like, uh, I think I can't remember the quote, but it was something like, it felt like we were all alone in this. You know, I keyed in on that. Yeah, go ahead. I was just going to say, Sarah, you said a brilliant thing at the end mm -hmm. in our conversation. Do you want to share it? <laughs> Which, which, me? Well, oh, yeah, Sarah. Yeah. Sarah, you weren't even with us. <laughs> I, thought, I was thinking, me, I didn't. <laughs> Sorry, Sarah. Well, I'm trying to rephrase it. Um, yeah, uh, it's like thinking of the museums, and uh, especially now uh, in Cornwall, where we are hopefully a very important part uh, of people's life, and uh, um, we are sort of the authority in a way as well maybe as museums we could give a um this kind of or address this need uh, for people to be uh, you know recognized and say you know we're here to support you it doesn't matter if you don't feel that the the main government is not doing what you need but at a local level we can do something for you obviously we need to decide what actually is the needs, but uh, at least you know play this this role uh, as a 
as authority in a way. Mm -hmm. yeah. I love that looking at the museum as a community anchor yeah. because I mean, so often we're looking at like, who could we draw from far away to our little museum, right? And in a lot of ways, our virtual existence has made it so that really, you know, people in Japan could be our audience. However, we're also hyper local because what we're doing is, you know, we're living in our houses and we're walking maybe like three blocks, 10 blocks, <laughs> you know, our existence is very small. Um, and so looking at who you could be to that, to those people who are right next door to your museum and, uh, you know, you know, in a way that's like right there for them. I love that. Any other comments before we go to break? I would love to hear any other thoughts you had. I think we were just saying similar about kind of the link between both of them in finding like-minded people and um, kind of like say facilitating be able, being able to find that emotional support through other people in your community. Um, you can't ignore what's happening with the leadership, but you can find a sort of safe space within people that feel the same as you. Right. We can't do anything about the leadership. Well, hopefully. I don't know. They're throwing bombs over the White House fence at this moment. So who knows? But um, yes, I, I love that, you know, like meet people where they are and do what you can, you know, even if you can't. Um, help sway politics, um, you can help be there for people, make them. Um, one thing that Chris mentioned to me was that he, um, that the, the woman that his sister-in-law who had COVID, who um, just to let you know, she's okay now, she's recovered, but um, she had a, a really isolating experience because you can't touch anybody when you when you have this disease, you know, it's very, very isolating. One group, she had a Facebook group with other people with um, the, had the virus, and that was really her only contact with people. And, um, you know, just made me think about, you know, some of the ways that maybe we could facilitate those um, things better. Um, anyway, I will let you guys, ha can we do like just a five minute break, like a quick water? Yeah, if you just come back, it's like, I've got it as 3.26, investment okay. 9.26 for you, so. It's close to five minutes as you can, and then we'll crack on because I know Andrew's got those to get through, but I'll see you all shortly. Okay. okay, I'll see you in a few minutes, guys. Full on um, fit going on upstairs. I hope nobody can hear that. Don't worry about it. Okay, I think okay. that's ready. <laughs> Good. That's why I got this fancy microphone in here. Should reduce the ambient noise. Okay, are we good to go? Mm hmm. Okay, I'm going to share my screen again. Okay. And slideshow. All right, so um, the last bit of this, and I'm trying to be mindful of time, is to take a look at some actual examples from the field. And I know sometimes that's really helpful to people to see what other museums are doing. Um, I already gave you a couple of examples having to do with physiological needs or safety needs, health needs, but these have to do with emotional needs. So um, the first example is from Lincoln's Cottage in, here in DC. Um, and for those of you who don't know, probably most people don't, um, President Lincoln spent most of his presidency in a different house, not the White House. Um, <clears throat> because he felt like the White House was too chaotic to have any kind of thinking time uh, during the war. You know, it was very hard to find space to think. And so he wrote his, the Emancipation Proclamation at this um, place called Lincoln's Cottage. Lincoln's Cottage has been really a great model in a lot of ways. But um, one of the things that I think is great about them is that they've really taken this whole idea of processing emotions um, you know, as a focus area for them right now during the pandemic. And just as one example, there was this, uh, they did a Zoom workshop where um, they called it a common humanity on online workshop. And they had a, a compassionate 
um, what was she called? Compassion therapist, I think was the name. And she kind of took people through um, some bigger ideas about how you can think about yourself uh, as a part of a greater whole in society. And then she took people and put them in breakout rooms similar to what we just did. And, you know, it's, you're thinking, like, what does this have to do with President Lincoln? Like, how is this mission related? But they really did a brilliant job of relating it to Lincoln's time there at Lincoln at, at the cottage um, and all the processing that he had to do there in that space. And it really uh, kind of what it did was it, re it united people with the same interest. You know, so here's all these people who like President Lincoln. You know, they're fans of the site and they're just getting a chance to talk with each other. So you know, they have this common interest but they're not really learning about Lincoln. They're having a chance to talk to each other, um, but they're finding people with common interests because they all have this interest in Lincoln, if that makes sense. Um, you know, so wh whatever your museum does, it's uniting people that have that interest. And even if it's, it's not teaching them something um, distinct about the content, um, it's giving them a chance to process through some of the things that they're feeling. And I like that they reached out to an expert. You know, they got someone who, with some skills and facilitation. And, um, and they did start off with some overall Lincoln framing, but it, Lincoln wasn't the focus. Um, just kind of getting inspiration from outside the field. Uh, I don't know how many of you are familiar with Adrian Marie Brown. But she is an activist, sort of poet, organizer sort of person. And she has a really cool Instagram account where she has these writing prompts for dealing with um, processing emotions and, and reflecting about the pandemic. And um, one of her writing prompts was called The Day Humans Left. And she says, tell a story of the beginning of our quarantine and the long-term isolation from the perspective of plants and or the non-human world. The day the humans left, right as the trees, birds, monkeys used to begging for food from tourists or as pets whose family is quarantined elsewhere or even as the clouds. Um, you know, so writing prompts are a really cool thing to do and I think um, you know, help people to, pro I mean, I know I process through writing when I wrote the blog post, actually, that this is based on, that was one way that I had to process through what I was thinking about. So great kind of um, idea for there. Um, there was something else that I experienced. And by the way, most of the things that I'm showing you, I have experimented with or I have tried because I don't like to espouse <laughs> anything that I haven't actually tried for myself. Um, but this is, um, there's a organization called deathcafe.com. I don't know if you've ever heard of this organization. They're all over Europe as well. Um, and they have host these workshops where people get together and talk about death. And it's not as dreary as it sounds. You know, the purpose of talking about death is so that you can, um, you know, have a better idea about how you want to live your life. Um, but also to make death not as scary. Because when we have so much death around us, you know, people are, uh, they're, you know, they're not used to talking about it. I mean, our culture is very hush-hush about death. So when it happens, you know, especially when you're talking about COVID, um, you have to, it's not even if you're sick, but, you know, what if you become sick? You know, it's on a lot of people's minds. I don't know how many of you have thought about, you know, do you have a will? Do you have, um, you know, what would happen to your children? Um, what are your, uh, you know, like last things that you haven't dealt with in your life, you know? And I attended one of these death cafes, which is now done on Zoom. And it was actually a group of people in Canada. Um, and it was just the most fascinating discussion. It was very intellectual. You know, it wasn't just people sitting around crying about death. It was kind of like um, philosophical in a way, um, talking about you know, getting your affairs in order doesn't just mean like having a will, 
but what are the emotional things that you know you have to deal with in your life that maybe you know how how do you deal with those things and then also why is you know why don't we talk about death um there was a death doula that was in this group which i didn't know was a thing but people who help others you know with that transition process there was a person that owned a funeral parlor funeral home and talking about the industry of death and the commercialization of death which i thought was really interesting um, but anyway, there's a lot of avenues here that museums could explore in hosting their own death cafes. Um, in fact, I know there have been art museums that have done this, where they've taken a piece of art as kind of a focus area for, you know, I mean, lots of artists have dealt with death, right? So looking at this as a jumping off point for uh, a stimulating conversation, and then, you know, bringing experts in, bringing um, people who have you know, either a therapist or have some training in the field, um, a death doula, somebody like that to kind of help guide the discussion would be really interesting, right? I don't know if there's a museum out there that doesn't deal with death in some way, right? I mean, look at all of the different museums that deal with weaponry, for example, you know, we talk about the weapons, but we never talk about the death. You know, how far does this cannon shoot? Let's put it out in the front yard so kids can climb on it, right? But we don't talk about what it's for. And, you know, dealing with those, um, dealing with the aftermath, right, is a healthy thing. Um, okay, so to address the emotional need of social connection, there's a lot of different options that are emerging out there. Um, one of these things that I investigated was uh, is called Netflix Party. Have you guys ever been involved in a Netflix party. So it's a it's actually a plugin for the Chrome browser. So you can only use it on Chrome and you can only use it for Netflix. Um, and everybody has to, you know, in your audience has to have that plugin. But what it does is it allows you all to have like a simultaneous chat um, during the show. And what these people did was, um, this was the, uh, what was the name of this place? Uh, FOST. It stands for, oh, Future of Storytelling. And they had invited a guy named Brian McDonald, who was the screenwriter for the movie Tootsie back in the day. I think that was like 1981 or something like that. And so the original screenwriter was kind of giving his, two, you know, kind of like behind the scenes information about this movie as we all watched it. Um, and then people were commenting back and forth. I thought it was really interesting. You know, there's there's all kinds of, um, you know, historical movies out there that um, apply to different people's historic sites or art related movies, uh, science, and you can invite curators to comment, you can invite costume experts to comment, you could, um, or you could just do it without an expert. You could just have a facilitator. Um, I actually thought with this particular example that that Brian McDonald could have benefited from a facilitator because he was very kind of like information without asking people's um, opinion or to get people involved. I thought that could be one way to improve it. Um, but Netflix is party is not the only way that you can do this. There's, um, uh, there's other apps out there. There's other websites um, that use the same, that might be better in fact um, to experiment with. I, I think on my blog post, I've written a couple of um, examples, but I have, I know that there are some. So don't forget that there is a digital divide. And so far I've given you examples that are technology based, but there are in fact lots of people that don't have the screens. They don't have enough screens for every family member, um, or they have no screens. So we have to think about how to reach those people too and not really reinforce the inequities that exist in our society. So what do people have when they don't have devices? Oh, I forgot to mention too, we're all tired of the screens, right? Like we're really tired. So we cannot just only design for virtual experiences. Here's a um, experience that was designed by a theater company using text messaging. So text messaging, think about that as a programming tool. 
really interesting. A lot of pe more people are willing to kind of get on their phones and text than they may be to glue themselves to um, a computer screen, uh, kind of in a more um, traditional sense. You know, a phone can be used for different things, right? So here, this was an immersive theater performance um, that I signed up for. It was five dollars, and it was about the, the the plot was that I was on a date. I had won a date with a guy named Cody. <laughs> so I was in this. I was in the story. And I had won this date and then Cody, you know, was like, can I pick you up at eight? And like, we were having this conversation back and forth. Um, it was really fun because I didn't know what was going to happen next. You know, it felt like it was actually happening. You know, he's like, hold on, I have to get my Uber, you know, and like, I waited, you know, like time went by, like it was real, right? Except it wasn't real. And then he started getting ridiculous, like asking me if we should fly somewhere and, you know, during the pandemic, like it was, you know, happening in real time. I was like, I'm pretty sure this is not the right time for an in-person date. You know, P.S. I'm gay. I don't know if that matters, Cody. Um, but, and then my wife in the next room was like, um, you're on a date. What's happening? You know, um, but it was still, you know, I, I don't know. <laughs> the format of the, the plot was not maybe like my favorite, but I love the idea I love the idea that you could be conversing with somebody uh, as a part of a performance, you know, and I thought of all these different ways that you could use this technology. Could you have a conversation with an object? Could you have a conversation with a person from the, you know, uh, a past historical figure? Could you have a conversation with someone from uh, who's, you know, a, a part of a work of art? Um, uh, or, or just kind of imagine a plot based on a, a work of art. You know, lots of different possibilities for that. Uh, I think it also work really well with a group text. I actually think it would work better as a group text because I felt like I was a little bit under pressure to respond to Cody, but maybe with like four or five other people, it would have taken the pressure off a little bit. Um, here's another lo-fi example, just using a phone. Um, the Lamb Museum in Amsterdam has this thing called View Phone. And so the quote is, anyone in need of stimulating conversation about art can sign up by email. All employees from curator to clean, cleaner to bookkeeper and director are available to callers every Friday afternoon during the home quarantine period. Um, so it sounds like from the description of it that the people are trained to not just be fire hoses of information, you know, which is like the worst, you know, the tour guides that are just like, I feel great talking to you about everything I know about this artwork. You know, it's not really about that person, right? You have to make it about the loneliness that the other person is feeling. So to involve them in the conversation, saying things like, you know, here's a photograph, here's a picture of this woman holding a bag. What do you think is in the bag? You know, really getting them to talk through and relate things to their own life. Um, stress relief. So, we have another need for stress relief, obviously, and um, what do we have? Maybe do we don't have our physical buildings, but we have the outside of our buildings. And the Anheuser-Busch Brewery in St. Louis has decided to um, take out all their Christmas decorations early and to just light up you know, the area, an area that they know that people are experiencing a lot more on foot um, and by, you know, driving through and just trying to create some novelty and fun in this time period. So thinking about what your museum could do to the outside of its building could be interesting too, to give people an uplift or, um, you know, a reason to walk by, you know, it's not just shuttered doors, um, you know, all programs canceled. It's a way of, um, you know, giving people a nice boost in the day. Um, earlier, I talked about the museum mindset being applied to everyday life, you know, the Omni Museum kind of mindset. This book, it was written a few years ago. Um, it's called How to Be an Explorer of the World by Carrie Smith. I don't know how many of you have heard this book, but it's really great. And it, I found it to be, I, I take, took a look at it off my bookshelf and I thought this would be such a great um, way to, to activate spaces in people's homes 
through activities in this book. Um, for example, there's a sound map activity. Sit in a location for one hour, document all the sounds you can hear and the times that you hear them, and mark the approximate location of the sounds in relation to you. Um, another thing that's really great about this is not just the idea that we're collecting kind of and observing, but that it's actually also a mindfulness exercise, you know, to really be in the moment. And if you present it like that to people, like this is actually good for you. This could help. And you look up the neuro, you know, the, you can look up um, how it affects your brain neurologically and, um, and give that information to people. It's really interesting, you know, how you could marry the, the, um, the science with, you know, what museum workers do all the time and looking at the world. Um, parents have particular needs. I am one of them. There's, you know, things that we do all day long and we just like really wish something different would happen during the day. Um, so here's an example in Milwaukee. People are really doing a lot of parades these days and I love it. Um, and I wonder what a museum application could be um, for parades, but Here's a, a parade of dinosaur costumes that are socially distant, but, you know, I wondered how, how that could be used in, in, you know, conjunction with education. You know, how, how could we make a parade? Um, I mean, it could just be for joy. It could be for no other reason. Um, but could there be another level to it where, like, kids are looking for different, you know, parts of the parade, um, you know, I, I see these examples all all over, like where there's, they're looking for teddy bears and windows and things like that. So what, like, how could we push that a little bit further? Um, I don't know. I have thought, thoughts, but I'll, I'll save those for you. You guys can think on that. Um, one of the last examples I have is the idea of activism and this idea that we, we talked about earlier where people are really... They want to be involved. They want to do something. They want to change the world. I don't know how many of you feel that way right now, but there are ways that museums can really help people find their purpose in that way. Um, and I, I'm going to point you to the, the Center for Artistic Activism is a group that is based in Brooklyn, but they operate all over the world. And they help artists to understand how to make their work more persuasive and more activist. And this is something that museums could actually train artists to do as well. Um, we don't have to be the activist, but we could train people in like what makes things participatory, what makes things per persuasive, um, what are the elements of social change, um, how has social change happened in the past, right? These are all the things that we can, we can help with as museums. Um, this is an example where a group got together and made their face masks into um, protest um, pieces. So saying hate is a virus, you know, referring to the Asian American um, biases and, and racism that's happening right now. And then they have these hashtags where you're supposed to post your pictures of your masks that you've created um, and post them on the internet. Um, the Center for Artistic Act Act Activism is also doing these things called Salk teams. And so Jonas Salk was the inventor of the polio vaccine. And um, there, you know, the, the Center for Artistic Activism is foreseeing that when a, a vaccine is created, that it will be given to people probably unequally. You know, that rich people will get it before people of color and people who can't afford it. And so they're already working on you know, how could, you know, cultural institutions get together uh, or artists and help make those things visible so that it, you know, doesn't happen that way. So I want I wanted to close with this idea of apocalypse. Um, usually if you watch television shows about the apocalypse, it's about everything going wrong, you know, everything being torn apart. Um, apocalypse is actually, a, um, it contains root words and the Greek for that, you know, the translation is uncover. It's uncovering. And if you think about all the things that this pandemic has uncovered, 
including uh, all of the essential workers that we now know are essential, um, you know, people, you know, even, te you know, teachers who are doing a bad job are now being see seen by their parents um, in the classroom. Right? So many things are more visible now to us where it's like we're woken up. And in some ways that can be a very good thing that this could actually be the apocalypse we've been waiting for, the things that needed to be uncovered so that we can um, address them and reinvent, as I think one of you said earlier, that this could be a different world if we actually um, take the action to make it a different world, right? Um, Aja Taylor was the one who wrote about this. Um, she's a community organizer in Detroit, and um, she's the one that quote comes from. It really resonated with me. Um, there's another activist uh, and writer named Ross Gay um, who, whose book is called uh, The Book of Delight. And this guy, this guy is like a joy. I mean, I, I, I listen to, I don't know if you listen to On Being, the podcast On Being with Krista Tippett, but he was on there. And everything this guy talks about is like finding the delights, you know, in, in the world, you know, the simple pleasures. And he was talking about gardening. And he said, it's fun just to be in a garden. For me, dreaming about what could happen, the kind of mystical space, actually, of trying to figure out what this thing that I do here could be in five years, that kind of strange dreaming space that it is. That's really where we are right now, right? We're in a dreaming space. Uh, there's also something really moving about putting a seed in the ground and it turning into something really different and a lot of something really different and potentially on and on a lot of something very different seeds so we all have them right now what will you grow in the future so we have to um i'm going to actually put um put this in the in the chat i have a another ask for you one last thing i'd like you to participate in today uh, if I can relocate my chat. So I'm going to post a, um, a link to something called an answer garden. So the answer garden is just, a, it's like a question. There's the link. Okay, there's the link. And when you open up that link, you should be able to see the answer garden here and the question is a seed of change in museums i will help grow when you put your answer in it has to be a short answer but it will appear with all the other answers we're going to grow a little metaphorical garden here i hope you guys don't think this is too woo woo but i think it's exactly the kind of thing we need let's write it down right the act of writing is sometimes great for commitment right so you can also see, I'm going to refresh the page, and you might start to see people's answers come in, because if you actually repeat, if you type in the same answer as someone else, the word becomes bigger in the answer garden. Let's see. Aha, okay, we're starting to see some answers. Nice, I like the, you know, I'm already seeing a better world here. I want to live in this garden right here. So far, so good. people first yeah listen and learn so as you are continuing to put your answers in there and I and it please do put them in there even if you don't think of it right away if you think of it in a few minutes and you want to put it in there I'm going to um, wait a little bit, maybe like 30 minutes or so, and then I'm going to forward this 
file to Celine, and then she can uh, send it back out to all of you to remember what, what you said you would do today. And um, we can, you can revisit it later. Um, I would also love to put it online. Um, I'm on Twitter as Museum Jones, and I like to um, uh, publish about, you know, all these great examples that I see happening. And I also like to encourage change in our field. And so um, I'd love to connect with you on Twitter. Uh, I also have a Facebook uh, page called Peak Experience Lab, where I also post about these things. So I want to leave you with some parting vibes from Adrian Brown. Adrian Brown, this um, I want to show you this this uh, podcast she was on. But one thing I thought was really great she that she said, and I. Full, fully agree with is that the first thing that we have to do is to feel our own feelings before we start adapting. So if you don't do that work first, please take some time, right, to feel the feelings and then adapt um, one step at a time. Okay, so here's Adrian Brown, and she has this kind of part. I thought this was a great kind of um, way to send everybody off onto their, and uh, you guys are in afternoon, night, okay? So listen. And I was there when, it, when, the t when the tide turned in Italy. And it's like, oh, I got to go. And I knew as I was leaving that I was coming back to the U.S. where the tide was going to come and it was not going to go well, right? Like I had no, uh, I've had no false beliefs about the state of our healthcare system or the state of our democracy, that we were going to navigate this well. And for me, it was important to feel all of that, to feel the anticipatory grief, to feel the fear, to feel whatever normal thing, whatever plans I needed to let go of. And for me, feeling like I'm a crier, you know, so I'm like, I am crying, okay? Um, and I, I have this little song that I've been singing that's like, I cry at night, but in the morning, I find my way one step, 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 the politics of feeling good. I, I'm feeling it in every cell right now, Adrian. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Magna. We're alive. Let's stay that way. Let's <laughs> love you. Let's stay that way. <laughs> okay. Love that clip from Adrian. Um, and this podcast is on, it's called On Point. And if you look at the, the whole thing is really great on um, pleasure activism, which is like put the pleasure together with activism. I think that's a, Really interesting combo, um, and I I know we've we're really at our time, but I'll just go ahead and and put up this last you know sort of resource slide if you guys want to take a screenshot or I know you're Celine you're recording this for later, but um, you know this is me. Um, the Empathetic Museum is another great resource. Adrienne Marie Brown. Uh, no proscenium is where they're doing a lot of interesting immersive theater using text messages, phones, uh, Zoom rooms, those sort of things. Um, designing for now is a really great, um, so Rachel Ginsburg from Co the Cooper Hewitt Museum in New York wrote a really great podcast on Medium where um, she talks about how to use people's environments um, as design elements. So that was a, um, that's a great one. And Center for Arti Artistic Activism, uh, Susie Wilkening's website. So um, I have enjoyed my time that I spent with you all today. Um, I am so humbled by the opportunity that we have to connect across the ocean mm -hmm. in this time. Um, and I hope, I can't wait to hear about all the things that 
um, that you do to make your garden grow. So thank you. Thank you, Andrea. It's been really a pleasure. I'm just wondering, has anyone got any quick questions or any comments on anything? Yeah, I'm here if you want. I know we're past time, but I'm definitely here if anybody wants to talk. Um, Celine, are we going to stay on and talk as an MPO group about our reflections or? Um, I think probably there's a few people with childcare commitments at the moment. I know that. Um, so we can always um, regroup if that would be helpful to people and um, maybe go away and have a little, a little think about it and then bring it back together and have a chat. Um, I'm just aware of the fact that it's probably really maxing out for a lot of people after two hours on Zoom um, when you've got commitments at home. Um, but does anyone have any questions for Andrea while she's with us still? I just had a quick one. Um, where can we find out more about the Omni Museum project? Ah, they, there's a website, Omni Museum, uh, is it .org? Um, and we're going to be doing, I'm looking at two screens right now. Oh, sorry. Um, Omni, it probably will come right up on my, yeah, we're, we're working on some initiatives to kind of, it feels like our moment right now, the Omni Museum project, it had been a little bit dormant, um, but we're trying to figure out ways to, um, one of the cool things that they have on the website are, I just happen to have them. There's these deck of cards, they're, they're design cards. And they basically have a whole list of tools that, we, that can be used. So for example, quests, sky writing, billboards, mobile apps, playscapes. You know, so it's like, a, and then there's a, a um, like a, a pamphlet that explains, you know, how to activate your neighborhood using the cards. It's like a little toolkit, which is pretty cool. Um, that's great. Yeah. Thank you. No, that sounds, it sounds really similar to um, something that I wanted to work on. So I'll definitely check that out. Oh yeah, please do connect. Um, I, I really want to keep in touch with everybody and see how because this is all like co-learning, right? I mean, we're just continuing to learn together to see what works and what doesn't work. Yeah, no, that's great. Definitely yeah. will do. Amy, if you don't mind, Andrea, I'll send you a link to a project that Amy's leading on at the moment. We've got an immersive museums um, event coming up, which you might be really interested in, which Amy's developed, so. Oh, great. Very much so. Yeah, anybody else? Or, or healthy skepticism is also invited. <laughs> yeah like I think um what you said is like sort of right but maybe like 75 percent um but yeah feel free to reach out to me too um by email or through any of these other ways and um I guess I'll sign off thank you everybody thanks for spending so much time in a focused way this afternoon when it's so warm here in oh yes so sorry yes <laughs> no. thank, thank you so much that was really thank good you, Andrew. that was great thank you. really appreciate it take care everybody and i'll be in touch soon cheers bye bye bye, bye. 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 <laughs> you know what I forgot to mention, isn't it? Um, keep calm and carry on. Isn't that the British way? Right. I mean, it's definitely something people say. Um